Welcome to A Historical Perspective of Smoking. I hope you find this topic interesting and informative. I've presented it several times and it's really interesting and fun and I hope you think it is too. So let's get started. The purpose of this is really to follow how tobacco has helped shape history with all of its ugliness that you'll see and uh, look at how people develop their attitudes towards smoking, which have changed drastically through the years. And then look at how we can learn from that to move forward with smoking practices. So I just want to say that this content will probably be offensive to some. And I'm just going to go ahead and read this. Some of the content in this presentation will not be considered politically correct or sensitive in modern times. It's not my intention to offend others, but to discuss the history of tobacco as it was in an effort to allow history to help us learn about where we have been, where we are, and where we're going. A practice that, in my opinion, is being lost in today's world. So if you're easily offended, you don't uh, subscribe to learning from the past, it'd probably be a good idea if you go ahead and close the presentation. But if you continue, I hope that you will uh, look at the content in terms of mistakes of the past and things that maybe weren't good, but in all their ugliness brought us to where we are and where we're going. To begin, originally tobacco was indigenous to Central America, as you can see in the box here. And these are Mayans in this picture on the right. Around 1000 BC, the Mayans used to chew and smoke the leaves, uh, both recreationally and as part of ceremonies that they felt would reach spirits of the dead. And as their civilization spread, so did tobacco use. In 1492, the Mayan natives of San Salvador, which you can see has an arrow pointing to it there on the map, thinking that the white men that were there were deities they gave Columbus gifts that were wrapped in their prized tobacco leaves, but not knowing that the leaves were part of the gift, Columbus threw them away. One member of Columbus's party, Rodrigo de Jerez, observed the natives smoking it, so he learned to smoke it himself, they taught him, and he wrote that the natives wrapped dried tobacco leaves in palm or maize in the manner of a musket formed of paper. After lighting one end, they commenced to what he called drinking the smoke through the other. De Jerez brought it back to Portugal and when his friends saw smoke coming out of his nose and mouth, they thought he was possessed by the devil and they put him in jail for seven years. While he was in jail, smoking caught on in Spain and became a widespread craze. And I like this cartoon. <laughs> and there you can see he now has cigars named after him. All right, in Europe in the 1500s, in 1529, a report uh, was published that claimed that tobacco treated a persistent headache, cold, and catarrh. And catarrh is like airway inflammation, mucus, coughing, stuff like that. Abscesses and sores on the head. In the 1530s, uh, the Europeans began to cultivate tobacco in the Caribbean island colonies, and then they would ship that tobacco back to Europe. So it's becoming a, a global uh, trade cash crop item. In France in 1559, there was a French physician named Jean Nicot, and he went to Portugal to arrange a royal marriage. He became convinced of tobacco's medicinal value, and he sent reports back to France about this newfound herb. After successfully curing the headaches of Queen Catherine of France, who was Henry II's wife, tobacco then became a hit in France, and it was called 
uh, the holy plant or the plant against all evils. That's what, that's what they named it. And actually, tobacco was introduced to Paris before that, but it was Ginico who made it popular and therefore he received credit. He wrote of its medicinal properties. In England in 1586, Sir Walter Raleigh, who you may have heard of, brought a load of tobacco back to the UK and it caught on as it had in other parts of Europe. So it's catching on everywhere and everybody thinks it's this great healing thing. A true pioneer of pipe smoking, Sir Walter Raleigh once persuaded Queen Elizabeth to try smoking. He was in fact such a fan of the pastime that upon his beheading for his part in the plot against King James, his tobacco box was found amongst his possessions with the inscription, quote, it was my comfort in those miserable times. Moving into the 1600s, in 1610, John Rolfe, who was colonizing Virginia, tried without success to cultivate the rustica species and learned that it had a bad flavor and was difficult to grow. There's a few different species of tobacco. Only a couple of them will grow and are, are palatable. Some people think none of them are palatable. So in 1612, he got a hold of some tobacco species uh, the seeds from Trinidad, and it grew well in the new colony. Tobacco crop, crops were shipped to England. Uh, the Spanish of South America had sold tobacco to the British for over 100 years. But the American tobacco industry started booming, and by 1619, the American tobacco industry equaled the Spanish South American industry, and it became a major export to England. At the beginning of the 1700s, about 38 million pounds of tobacco were being imported into England. The settlement of Jamestown, which ultimately succeeded in settling America by the English, is due to Rolf's success in growing tobacco. Early 1600s, many Europeans began to settle in the American colonies to make a living growing tobacco on the plantations there. At this time, smoking out of clay pipes was popular in America. And because of the English traveling to and from Europe, clay pipes caught on there as well. Various forms of tobacco administration were used by doctors to treat things like flatulence, uh, which is passing gas, a bad cough, labor pains, and delirium. One man wrote, that moderate use of tobacco would remove anything that harms a man from the girdle up. Some, however, felt that tobacco should be avoided as it harms the brain and liver. In addition, some thought anyone wanting children should avoid it as well. A Spanish physician named Nicolas Monardes published a medical paper called Tobacco and Its Great Virtues, where he wrote that tobacco cured halitosis, which is bad breath, a toothache, and cancer. Somebody else wrote, a custom loathem, loathsome to the eye, hateful to the nose, harmful to the brain, dangerous to the lungs, and the black stinking fume thereof, nearest resembling the horrible Stygian smoke of the pit that is bottomless. Someone else wrote, life is a smoke. If this be true, tobacco will thy life renew. Then fear not death nor killing care, whilst we have the best Virginia here. Somebody else wrote, but hence thou pagan idol tawny weed, come not within our fairy coasts to feed. Our well-worn gallants with the scent of thee, sent for the devil in his company. The people in the south parts of Virginia esteemed tobacco exceedingly. They said that God in the creation first made woman, then man, then maize, and fourthly, tobacco. In 1617, Dr. William Vaughn wrote a poem that we're going to revisit later. And he wrote, tobacco, that outlandish weed, it spends the brain and spoils the seed. It dulls the sprite, it dims the sight. 
it robs a woman of her right. So what we can see here is that there are a lot of uh, conflicting viewpoints here in the 1600s, but the prevailing thought was that tobacco was uh, a good thing and it certainly was lucrative. In 1665 in London, they saw the bubonic plague. No one knew how to cure it, so uh, they looked to tobacco since it had historically been praised for its cure-all properties. Some tried to use it against the plague. In fact, one public school for boys mandated a morning pipe in an effort to curb the spread of the plague. During the Revolutionary War, France helped finance the war in exchange for tobacco. In fact, as a war strategy, one of the goals of British General Charles Cornwallis was to destroy the American tobacco fields in 1780 and 81. In 1828, physician William Wilhelm Passelt and chemist Carl Reinman isolated the active ingredient and called it nicotine in honor of Jean Nicot. So here are some of the ways tobacco was administered in its early days. So you can see cigarettes didn't really come out till the mid 1800s. And so, in the mid 1800s is when they started with some techniques of mass production, which I'll show you here in a minute. And that made them more affordable, more accessible to greater numbers of people. In 1852, the first matches known as Lucifer's were manufactured, making it easier to light up. And here we go in 1881, they, uh, this is the first cigarette machine and again, made it more affordable, more accessible. Uh, this machine from 1881 could make 200 cigarettes per minute. In the early days of smoking, uh, the cigarettes were given to soldiers to help with morale because they were away a lot from home, away from to, you know, fighting wars and things. Now here in the 1800s, we see our historical timeline. We start seeing tobacco advertising. So as we look at advertising throughout the rest of the presentation, notice who the tobacco companies target, how they target them and how that changes throughout time to target the prevailing culture in America. Now this advertisement, I just don't get it. I tried to find out about Topsy Tobacco and the company that makes them, but it, there is nothing anywhere that talks about it. I uh, don't know if it's been removed because it would be considered offensive, understandably. But uh, I was able to find out the, the word child is uh, in the vernacular back then, the African-American vernacular that, that referred to child. And I not sure what make it lively meant, but that's in both of the ads on the left and the right. Uh, it looks, if you read what it says, it looks like they're sneaking to smoke. And I'm not sure who this ad is targeting, but certainly would not be considered appropriate today. And here we go, targeting children in 1874. But don't worry, in 1908, the Children's Act banned the sale of tobacco to children under 16. 1881, <laughs> here we go. Uh, cigars of joy gives immediate relief of asthma, uh, cough, bronchitis, hay fever, influenza, and relieves shortness of breath. And the flu, I don't get that. Dr. Batty's asthma cigarettes, uh, I love this one, uh, effectively treats bad breath. Okay. Not to be given to children under eight, it said. Uh, and here we go. More treatment of asthma, bronchial trouble, trouble allergies. It's incredible. We cross into the 1900s. 
Cigarettes were issued to soldiers from World War I to 1975 after the Vietnam War. In their meal sea rations, they would find, soldiers would find uh, Camel cigarettes, Chelsea, Chesterfield, Fleetwood, Lucky Strike, Rally, Old Gold, Old Gold, Players, Wings, and Philip Morris cigarettes. Smoking grew as part of the mainstream culture as soldiers returning home from the war introduced cigarette smoking to their friends and families. So again, just another layer of how smoking spread. And here we can see government issue cigarettes that come in soldier meal packs. I was in the military in the late eight, uh, uh, 1980s and they, we still had some cigarettes in there for a little while. I don't know if they were, I don't know how old those things were, but we did. There were five cigarettes in there. Oh, the twenties, Santa up on the roof. That's terrible. Here we go. Luckies are easy on my throat, says Santa Claus. Oh, here we go. Now we start marketing to women in the 20s and 30s, which in America was uh, an early feminist movement. So the cigarette companies, uh, they, they took this opportunity to say, hey, you know, you're women, you should be smoking, and this is going to help you lose weight, give you a slender figure. So historically, smoking had been a male practice, but again, the marketing companies, the, the tobacco companies saw an opportunity as smoking started to spread to, to really push this uh, toward women and made it seem glamorous in the movies and again, make, you know, told them they would have this slim figure if they smoked. Oh yeah, there we go. Smooth taste expectant mothers crave. Oh, this one's terrible. Taste isn't the only reason I smoke. People are always telling me that smoking causes birth, low birth weight. Talk about a win-win, an easy labor, a slim baby, and the full flavor of Winston's. That's pretty incredible. Oh boy, okay. So this ad is from 1968 or the 70s, which is later in our timeline, but I put it here to emphasize that there's a specific target market to women. Again, it began in the 20s, as we saw in the previous slide, talking about weight loss properties. Then we saw the culture of the all-American family where they targeted preg uh, pregnant women. And then here they're obviously marking a cigarette that is made for women during a time when empowerment of women was really getting a foothold in the early 70s. I couldn't find the exact date of this, but definitely late 60s, early 70s, um, time when you know the we had another big uh, women's movement. Helen Reddy wrote that song, I'm Woman, Hear Me Roar. And the song goes on to say, and numbers too big to ignore. Uh, the point is, is that Cigarette marketing, as we said earlier, is geared toward the culture of the time. So this one, it says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this to you because this is good. Virginia Slims, especially for women, because they are biologically superior to men. That's right, superior. Women are more resistant to starvation, fatigue, exposure, shock, and illness than men are. Women have two X chromosomes in their sex cells, while men only have one X chromosome and a Y chromosome, which experts consider to be the inferior chromosome. They're also less inclined than men to congenital baldness, albinism of the eyes, improperly developed sweat glands, color blindness, <laughs> defective hair follicles, defective iris, defective tooth enamel, double eyelashes, skin cysts, short-sightedness, night blindness, nomadism, retinal detachment, and white occipital locks of the hair. This is just a <laughs> cigarette advertisement. In view of these and other facts, the makers of Virginia Slims feel it is highly inappropriate that women continue to use the fat stubby cigarettes developed for men. You've come a long way, baby. 
So I think that's kind of funny. Not, not funny, but it is how ridiculous some of these things were. So now we come into the age of selling cigarettes by putting the doctor's approval on it. So this would squelch any thought that some had that evidence didn't show had the health benefits that it historically been claimed to have. And so the medical community, they mobilize them in their advertisement, say, hey, if your doctor says it's okay to smoke, then you should smoke. And Dr. Rorig here died of lung cancer, by the way. And there we go. Lots of physician ads talking about digestion. And your dentist recommends Viceroy cigarettes. More doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. And then in the 40s and 50s, they started uh, using professional athletes who smoked and used them to advertise cigarettes. I don't know if all the athletes smoked. I know some of them did, but they used them in, in marketing as well, which really, you know, again, if you appeal to people's sense of doctor smoke, athlete smoke, it can't be bad for you. And soccer player. And then Jesse Owens, he died of lung cancer. And then reach for a lucky instead. You can look like the guy on the right instead of the guy on the left. Throat protection against irritation and cough. In the 50s, the link between lung cancer and smoking was beginning to be seen. In December 1952, Reader's Digest published an article called Cancer by the Carton, in which it revealed for the first time to the public the growing medical concern about this possibly fatal link. And so here, now we're appealing to the public sense of scholarship. If smart people smoke, then it must be a good choice for you to smoke. Scientific evidence of smoking. I was talking about how, uh, you know, it's smoother, not as irritating. <laughs> this one wouldn't be so bad if they weren't so confident in underlining the word not. They do not cause cancer. That's from leading doctors in the field of cancer research. And there's our former president, Ronald Reagan. Then we have the cute baby selling cigarettes. My dad would never smoke anything but a Mar Marlboro. You're darn tootin' my dad smokes Marlboro. And treat your dad right on Father's Day. Give him three cartons of cigarettes. <laughs> All right. This one's kind of odd. Let's face it. You could get hit by a bus tomorrow. Go on. Have a fag. Fag is another word for cigarette. You know, the idea here being that uh, just do what you want today because you could get hit by a bus tomorrow. Kind of an odd advertisement. And there, Ronald Reagan is selling his cigarettes, or giving them away for Christmas, rather. <laughs> Not to beat the doctor thing to death, but in the upper right there, it says, I'm going to grow 100 years old, smoking camels. Little girl talking to the doctor there. Okay. So I mentioned this before, but uh, this is the... 1952 Reader's Digest, you know, where they're talking about cancer by the carton, revealed for the first time to the public that uh, there might be a fatal link between smoking and, and cancer. And then we saw the filters on the cigarettes. Oh, and the Flintstones smoking cigarettes. Okay, 1964, the U.S. Surgeon General reported that smoking cigarettes cause cancer. So as we go through time, getting more and more evidence that smoking is bad for you. 
1966, tobacco companies were made to print health warnings on packets of their cigarette brand. Late 60s, cigarette manufacturers began to develop light cigarettes, and we're going to talk about those here shortly. This one's just odd. Blow in her face and she'll follow you anywhere. That's uh, Tipolet cigarettes. Pretty sure that doesn't work. Here's a nice offensive one. Cigarettes are like women. The best ones are thin and rich. It's so weird to read that through modern times, the filter of modern times, because it's just so out there. Uh, <laughs> we've just come, uh, things have changed a lot. I just thought this guy looked kind of creepy there. Not sure how he's selling cigarettes, but I don't know. Somebody thought saw that picture and said, yep, that's a good idea there. 1971, a ban on cigarette advertising was put on TV, radio, and public transport. 1988, really wasn't that long ago. And the Surgeon General concluded that after extensive research, nicotine is addictive. However, in 1994, tobacco company executives swore under oath that tobacco is not addictive. I personally think this is an example of don't let evidence get in the way of your agenda. Remember Dr. Vaughn's poem in 1617, Tobacco Spoils the Seed? A 1994 report stated that smokers were 50% more likely to become impotent. All right, so that's where we were. Where are we now? Let's talk about this a little bit. So as you can see here, smoking rates continue to drop as they have for decades. And that's a good thing. Uh, and right now we're at about 15 or 16. Uh, I think as of when I looked in 2020, uh, it was 15.3. Now that doesn't mean that 15.3% of the population smokes. That's an average. If you look at different socioeconomic classes, different races, uh, marital status, economic, uh, socioeconomic status, education level, sexual orientation, uh, gender, age, uh, part of the country, state you live in, all of those things make this data go all over the place. But the average is right now around 15.3%. You can see in the 1950s, almost half of the population smoked. And again, it was considered healthy uh, and it was deeply ingrained in our culture and television. Even though smoking has decreased, uh, tobacco sales have not. This is because manufacturers have, since the 1950s, added filters, which reduces the amount of tobacco per cigarette Stems are ground up, which added bulk, which reduces the amount of tobacco per cigarette. It's now freeze dried and fluffed and injected with gas to expand it to make it more absorbent and burn faster. And uh, they put additives in it. And low tar and low nicotine cigarettes uh, reduce obviously the amount of nicotine as well. So all of that reduces the amount of nicotine. So Currently, it takes about two thirds of the amount of tobacco that it did to make a cigarette in the 1950s. A 1950s cigarette contained about two and a half milligrams of nicotine. Now it's about one milligram of nicotine per cigarette. So the body actually craves a certain dose of, of nicotine. So when you have a cigarette that doesn't have as much nicotine in it, the studies show, they've actually researched this, that they watch people and they either smoke more cigarettes, they inhale deeper, or they puff more often to obtain their optimal dose of nicotine. According to the CDC, illness-related cigarette smoking, uh, you know, it, illnesses related to cigarette smoking costs the U.S. around $300 billion a year. 
It's the leading cause of preventable death in the U.S. and ranks number four on the CDC's leading causes of death. And it's been there for a long time. And it also contributes to the first three leading causes of death and others. And it has no therapeutic health benefits, yet it's perfectly legal over the counter. All right. So now we get to, again, we're talking about where we are looking at vaping. It was originally hopefully going to be um, a form of nicotine replacement therapy, but, you know, to help people quit smoking, but it's the data is coming out and it's actually turning out to be the opposite. So consider the following data. More eighth graders try uh, the e-cigarettes than cigarettes. 9.5% try e-cigarettes, 3.9% try cigarettes. Of those, 30% of the e-cigarette triers will move to cigarettes, where 8% of people who tried cigarettes will continue to smoke. High school students who used e-cigarettes in the last month were seven times more likely to report that they smoked cigarettes when asked six months later as compared to students who didn't use e-cigarettes. And some say, I don't know how this is provable, but it kind of makes sense. Uh, some say that e-cigarettes, it's become like the thing to do. There's a culture of smoking culture of e-cigarettes. And so it would draw people in who otherwise might not try cigarettes, especially because they're told that it's harmless. A study of more than 800 people who said they were using e-cigarettes to help them quit traditional cigarette smoking, only 9% reported having quit when asked a year later. So you think about the cost and the dangers associated with e-cigarettes, and it's just the, the data is showing it's not a really good way to quit. Plus, when you're smoking you know, the e-cigarettes, the, the vaping, you don't really know what the dose is. Uh, you don't really know what's in there. Even the supposed nicotine-free ones have some nicotine in them. Some of them do. And most people think there's only flavoring in there. But you know, there's irritants and other things that we don't even know all the time what's in those. There's also a battery explosion risk. And they're finding out now that it may harm some cardiovascular cells and inflammatory cells. So to wrap this up, where are we going? Well, I'll close with this thought. We need to mind our place in history so we don't get too proud. As we look back and judge the past through our modern filter, you can bet that many people later will be laughing at what we do. Remember that many of the older generations were raised with the idea that smoking was good and was deeply part of the culture. You might say, well, they know better now. Well, one thing we know is that knowledge doesn't always change behavior. We all do things knowingly that we know that we shouldn't. So bear with the people who are addicted. It's a really addictive drug. And uh, hopefully we will look at the data that we are collecting on modern smoking practices and keep ourselves headed in the right direction, which is hopefully to reduce smoking. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. You can check out other videos, respiratory related videos on my YouTube channel.